Awesome. All right. So today we're going to be talking about ancient history, very specifically ancient civilizations that are post Tower of Babel. Now, the whole purpose of my presentation is because secular timelines are really, really, really hard to understand. And most of the time, they don't even make sense if you actually lay them out on, say, like a timeline or a map. So we're going to talk about their definition of secular time. So in the beginning, all the timelines that I'm going to be giving are not young earth or biblical timelines. And next, we're going to talk about the definition of a period. We've kind of gotten some jabs in the past, uh, me and others who have talked about pyramids. And so we're just we're going to go to some definitions of pyramids and all the pyramids across the world. And we're going to talk about definitions uh, that I call upper and lower limits of timelines. And this can be for civilization and for technology. And then we're going to go in and talk about the old and the new world civilizations. And these are the first civilizations. I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not going to talk about many civilizations after that. And then this is just what I think is a basic guidelines for navigating ancient history based on our young earth model. And I just thought this would be kind of cool for you guys. This is a little bonus unusual history. So I was watching The Gladiator last night, and Commodus is not actually uh, presented in that movie accurately. And what's really interesting is Fick Meijer, M-E-I-J-E-R, wrote a book called The Gladiators. Now, this isn't necessarily a fact. This is some mythology that's written into history. Could be true, may not be true. But gladiators were seen as very, very much sexual icons. And Commodus, uh, his father, his name is Marcus Aurelius, and he is the last of the five good emperors. And one of the, what we call proto-historians, which means like pre-historians, uh, talked about how Marcus Aurelius was very concerned because his wife was in love with one of the gladiators. Now, she had never gone and, you know, um, had sex with him or anything like that, but he found out about it. So he went to the local priest and the priest said, well, you need to kill this gladiator, uh, fill a bathtub with his blood make her bathe in it and then have sex with her afterwards. And what's interesting is that Commodus was very messed up in the head. He was about 18 years old when his father died and he thought he was a gladiator. In fact, he thought he was Hercules in the picture on the right kind of shows like his outfit and he would actually even participate. But sometimes he would have a sword and he would give the people sponges and then he would just kill them all. So I thought that was kind of an interesting, you know, uh, neat little history thing. All right, so first, let's talk about secular timelines. All right, most people have heard of the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. But most don't know that the Stone Age is actually split up into three different areas, as you see there on the screen. And I loved how Answers in Genesis put it for the uh, Pale Paleolithic, which is also known as the Old Stone Age, 2.5 million years to 10,000 BC. So you're saying that our ancestors used the same stone tools for 50,000 generations. It really makes no sense. And if you see how quickly we uh, shift from the end of the Paleolithic to the Mesolithic and to the Neolithic, it doesn't actually make any sense. It's almost like technology just got like sparked by something. By what? They don't even know. And then we'll go into a little bit of the Bronze Age. We will not talk about the Iron Age. Um, and it's only because the Bronze Age actually uh, overlaps with the Neolithic. And we're mainly going to be talking about the Neolithic. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. So why is it so important? Well, there's something in history, it's kind of on the verge of anthropology and history called the Neolithic Revolution. They will state, suddenly, we basically became urbanized and all these technologies came out. You know, we went from like simple hunters and gatherers to creating literally the top picture up there is, uh, uh, it's a recreation of the city of Uruk, which is about the same time as the city of Ur where Abraham was born. That's a very complex city structure well laid out, well planned, going from hunter and gatherers that were hitting over hitting each other over the heads with clubs. You know, I know it's a little bit of exaggerated, but if you look at the dates that you see on the screen right here, you can see that they don't even agree when the Neolithic Revolution started or when it ended. Why is this important? This is what came out of the Neolithic Revolution. When I was reading about this in my class, I thought, this is ridiculous. You know, how can they say that this just came out at a sudden point in time? When this is everything that we see today, you know, math and science is so, 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 ah, social stratification, you know, technology, all kinds of stuff. And we have evidence of this going back in secular timelines, um, 3000 to 4000 BC. And I kind of like this quote, a people without knowledge of their past, past history, origin and culture is like a tree without roots. 
because of evolution and because of the time, because of how they're changing our timelines, we actually do not have roots. They have been completely chopped off. And the biggest issue is, is that they have to have these timelines. It has to go from something rudimentary, which is stone tools to iron. It sounds neat, you know, like this chronicle is neatly laid out of our prehistory to modern history. Um, and it seems orderly, but it actually fails to take um, into account the entire truth. And then this leads into artifacts that are outside these timelines will be discarded and they have been for almost two centuries or dated differently. <clears throat> and by no means don't think that, that they're unaware of this. No, no, no. They are arbitrarily shift dates whenever they want to. And it's not just forward or backwards. It's both. Um, and then later on the slide, you're going to see how that there's some major gaps in their historical timelines. And they, are, they just seem so out of order. Now, many major historians are not going to claim ancient aliens, but if you start to push them on the subject of how they came up with these megalithic structures in the past and many other things, they won't know. Um, obviously, we know this from evolution. There's lots of storytelling and blatant lies. So I actually started to make this a long time ago, and I left this in um, RJ at one of my debates made a stab at me that there was uh, no step pyramids in Egypt. How funny. I literally just did a very simple Google search. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I think it's Dozier. Um, is the first pyramid in Egypt before the Great Pyramids of Giza. And I put on here the Great Pyramid of Tena. I can't pronounce that word. Um, anyways, uh, that one is, let's see, I got it written down. Um, was built about 1200 to 900 BC. And if you just, just look at the three of them, you'll see they all look like pyramids. So, you know, what does that mean? How do we... How do we navigate this? So I got four pyramids up here. <clears throat> and when I looked at the classifications of these pyramids, you can see that they are stepped pyramids or stepped pyramid ziggurats. And as an example is the Monte Alban in South Mexico is literally classified the same as these two ziggurats on the bottom. And Tikal uh, Guatemala is, is classified as a step pyramid, but it's just a little bit taller of a ziggurat. And there are definitely more examples in the old world and the new world where they're all stepped pyramid ziggurats. Yes, they may have been used for different things. Mostly they were almost all used for about the same thing, depending on who was building it at the time. I thought this one was kind of neat. This is not necessarily a super old pyramid, but it is the largest in the entire world. And the two pictures on the right are recreations of the entire site. So you can see that they actually built into the hill or on top of the hill and then in the surrounding areas. It was, it's actually quite neat. And those stairs on the top left right there are actually much taller than you think they are. Not taller as in like, I would take a giant to walk up the stairs. They're just bigger. So if a, I wish I had had a person on there so I could show the size of it. And here's something kind of interesting. Um, Sardinia, Italy is a little island to the west of Italy. And here's another pyramid, a stepped pyramid ziggurat. Um, in Sudan, South Sudan, uh, with the old uh, Kushite Empire is more pyramids. And you can see that they've got some really odd dating here, right? Because in Italy, 3600 BC, and then you've got these pyramids at 25, 1500, 25 to 1500 BC. They're out of Africa theory, you're going to see is going to have some huge, huge issues just with history alone. This is without even dating, like considering their dating methods. Here's another interesting one. This is the pyramid in uh, the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans, um, come after the Minoans. The Minoans are before them. Uh, Minoans and Mycenaeans basically kind of set up the <clears throat> classical Greek culture. So everything you see about Greek culture and stuff like that, besides the movie Troy, is actually based on classical Greece, not ancient Greece. Troy is actually based on ancient Greece. This particular pyramid has an 1800-year period where they have no idea when it was built, 2000 to 200 B.C., and I put the one in Cambodia, even though this one's actually a little, you know, quite a bit newer, but it's dated to the reign of a king, meaning that he used it and it was built prior to that. And this just goes to show how horrible their timelines are in dating. And I loved this picture. When the Aztecs showed up into the Valley of Oaxa, which is O-X-A-C-A, -A, um, they had no idea who built these pyramids. And this avenue that you see down the middle is actually called the Avenue of the Dead. <clears throat> and as you can see at the top, these are called the Pyramid of the Sun and, Sun and Moon of Te, Tehotihuacan. 
Now let's get some dates so you can kind of get an idea of the Aztecs and these pyramids. The Aztecs did not come into that valley until about 700 to 800 AD. And their empire did not flourish and get to like the pinnacle of their empire until the middle of the 1300s. This is, you know, a century or two before the Spanish um, invasions. And the date that they have, which they don't know very much about these two pyramids, but the date of the construction of these two pyramids is 200 BC to 280. They really have no idea. So some other stabs that we've also gotten about, you know, ancient constructions and um, the technologies of ancient people is that pyramid building is uh, the same as building um, building with Lego blocks, stacking stones. Oh, whoop de doo da They stack stones. Not a big deal, right? Um, and what did that other person say? Oh, sand building, sand castles. I don't know about you, but when I look at these pictures, I don't think that they were just stacking blocks. They knew exactly what they were doing, and they were actually on cardinal lines, and they aligned um, celestially with the, with the moons or with the stars or with summer or winter solstices. They had advanced knowledge in um, astronomy and stuff like that, mathematics, geometry. And just looking at the tonnage of these, these are the metric tons of these pyramids. And these two are in Egypt. Obviously, the one on the left is in Egypt, too. Now, you saw earlier that I put the Great Pyramid of Chalo Cholula as the largest pyramid in the world. It is because of the area that it spans and the hill that it's built into. But when they were gathering or when they were gathering data on the metric tons that they physically built, it's actually third on the list. Now, when I was reading this website, I thought it was kind of interesting that they had this uh, hotel in Vegas built in 93, but it's actually sixth on the list. The Bent Pyramid of Egypt is actually, you know, has more, more metric tons than the one in Las Vegas. But this just goes to show how big and how megalithic these structures were. And lastly, we've got the Pyramid of the Sun. The Pyramid of the Moon is more likely the same size. It only listed this one. Um, El Tigre and La Danta. Uh, if you would like to actually search more pictures of these, type in El Mirador. M-I-R-A-D-O-R. -R. That's the location that it's at. And there are actually two pyramids, um, but they've been kind of overtaken by the jungle and stuff like that. So looking at monuments and the shape of monuments is not the only evidence of the design in history that shows that we come from a common ancestor with a common memory. These structures are well planned out, very detailed, artistically made, and they are made from stone. And most of the time, we don't even know how they did it. Um, but we can also add in other stuff as well that shows design in history. So according to secular, this, this is their timelines, the Neolithic Revolution, about 5000 BC, um, they will not admit to any complex cities before 5000 BC, or I'm sorry, after 5000 BC. There isn't a historian, anthropologist, or linguist out there um, that will say that there are any diverse languages more than 4,500 years ago. I think that's an arbitrary date because, as you'll see on the next slide, some of the earliest datings for writings actually only go back to about 3,000 BC per secular timelines. Um, some of the largest monuments besides uh, places like Gobekli Tepe um, are about 5,000 BC. And the only science thing that I'll add in is the uh, y, y chromosome bottleneck. But it's interesting how all these timelines sit at about this time, about 1,500 to 2,000 years after the biblical flood. Now, I don't think that this is, you know, by accident or whatever. No, this is by design. They knew exactly what they were doing, and they purposely shift these dates backwards so that way it does not line up. And you'll come to see that in a moment. All right. So I talked about in the beginning about upper limits, upper and lower limits, actually. Um, on the next slides, I'll talk about civilization upper limits. But this is technology upper and lower limits. And this just goes to show you how ridiculous their narratives are. Bow and arrows are claimed to be used 20,000 BC, but not regularly until the Egyptians in 3000 BC. That's like the latest one that they can find with bow and arrows where it's, mm, how do they put it, universally, but uh, used all the time. And you're going to see this narrative is the same thing with all of these. Now, as I said before, writing uh, cuneiform is only about 3,200 years old. Egyptian writing is about the same. Things like 3,500, maybe 3,000. Um, and you will not find writings any older than that. And then when we go to metallurgy, just imagine you're looking at a map of the world and you have 10 pins. Just place them in random arbitrary places. 
that's where they have found metallurgy. And they'll just say, oh, well, we just found this, these one people and they had a kiln or uh, something to, um, to smelt metal. But then for a thousand years, they didn't do it again. And then they'll find another one. Oh, but for a thousand years, they didn't do it again. And I say mine is 1500 years because the Bronze Age starts in 3500 BC. Before that is the Stone Age. If they're actually going to want to keep to their timelines, then they can't find metallurgy during the Stone Age because otherwise they're going to have to ship the Stone Age back. And you'll see how these timelines overlap, overlap all the time. Agriculture. They have found a few instances where they say it dates to 12,000 BC. They're not used regularly until 4500 BC. Uh, I put roof tiles on here because they have um, only a couple of sites where roof tiles were made and they're dated to about 2300 to 3000 BC, but they weren't actually invented and used uh, regularly until 700 BC. It's a gigantic timeline, same with the bows and arrows, but they'll say, oh, well, they had roof tiles, you know, they knew how to make them, but they just, you know, they only made them for a certain time and then they stopped. Well, why? There's no reason whatsoever. Now, if you like my theory, they either got repurposed or destroyed, broken in battle. We've destroyed our history so many times. It would be hard to know for sure what happened to them. I purposely think that the majority of them probably got uh, repurposed. Now, an inter interesting one is calendars. Um, you've got Stonehenge. Uh, you've got some underwater Stonehenges, and they're actually all celestial lying. There's one in Sudan. Um, there's one in Germany. And they're all over the place, and they date between 5,000 to, I think the latest one's like 12,000 or something like that but they don't consider them formal calendars. These people spent time and effort to map out the heavens, building mounds, stones, huge stones like Stonehenge. But then they say, oh, but formal calendars weren't used till 3000 BC. It's because they can't account for technology in the past, so they just disregard it and say, oh, well, these are just you know small little circumstances. <clears throat> silk I put on here because they found uh, silk in some caves not really sure how they dated it to 8,000 years ago. Uh, but the only evidence we have in secular timelines is 3,500 BC, where it starts being used regularly and farmed regularly. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> so these are the civilization upper limits. This is the old world. Um, so you've got Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, the Indus Valley, and then ancient China. So you consider these kind of the cradles of civilization. And it's funny, even though they have this out of Africa theory, they still look at these and say, oh, these are the cradles of civilization. Well, if they are, then why do we come out of Africa just to build civilization there? Why don't we have Southern sites in Africa that have got structures, complex cities, and then we see us moving further out? And you'll see this on a map that I have all drawn up. So you can kind of look at the dates here, but I want to point out one particular, the city of Ur. In the Bible, the first city to come out of the Tower, Tower of Babel was Ur. But they like to date Ur less or earlier in its date than um, the Enki Temple, Eridu City, and Uruk. But it's funny, when they show images of what Enki look like or Eridu or Uruk, they actually so, show pictures of Ur because they don't have very much on those other cities. Ur is actually way more preserved. <clears throat> But you'll see how that's interesting next. Oh, and actually, I want to point out another one for ancient China. So uh, Erlitau, um is disputed, and so is the Zaya dy dynasty, dynasty. They are both disputed dates. Um, I didn't do a ton of research on ancient China, but roughly speaking, the Zaya, the Zaya dynasty is about 2000 BC. So you'd say circa. So like maybe 1800 to 2000 BC. But they know for sure that Erlitau was before that. They're just not sure how long. All right, next. So this is the New World. Um, you have the Olmecs and the Mayans. Uh, and these are some of their sites. And that shows the times. Um, Olmec was actually considered the mother culture for the longest time. And they're finding out that these timelines are not actually matching up. Now, we're going to, you know, we have to leave out Africa theory because that's over on the other side of the world. Now we have the land bridge theory. And you're going to notice that there are sites in South America that are actually older than the North American sites, like far North American sites, where the Olmec, the Zapotec, and the Aztecs and the Mayans are at is actually called Middle America. And then you have South America, and then you have North America. So where basically Mexico is, um, actually, here's my next one, like Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, this is considered Middle America, I think, or yeah, Central America, excuse me. <clears throat> 
So it, it, it's typically shown in history that the Olmec precede the Maya, the Zapotec precede the Aztecs. But if you look at this map and you ever look up maps of the Olmec, the Maya, the Zapotec, and the Aztecs, they actually all overlap in history at some point. Their territories, there is definitely strong Olmec influence on the Maya, but there's also Olmec in, um, influence on the Aztecs. Um, for the most part, the Olmec is considered the oldest civilization before the Zapotec. There's also the Toltec, but I'm not going into them because they're like in the middle of the Zapotec and the Aztecs. But each of these places where you see um, pyramids and like little city symbols, they're not exactly where they should be. But they do show um, the structures that are out there, the pyramids that are out there, and generally speaking, where major ancient civilizations were. Uh, let's see. Okay. And so then we'll go down into the Andeans and the Incans. The Andeans are obviously named because of the Andes that are along um, the east side of Peru. Uh, let's see. Chavan de Huentar. Let me see. So I actually found some new dates for El Perazo and Chavan de Huentar. Um, El Perazo is estimated to be 3000 to 1700 BC. The oldest disputed date of the Olmec is like maybe 1800 BC. And uh, uh, I can't pronounce the pyramid's name, but the uh, Olmec heads, they all of those only date to 1200 to 900 BC. <clears throat> and that little circle that I have, that orange circle is below the Olmec. Um, that's considered the cradle of civilization for the Olmec, meaning that's the oldest sites that they have, and then they spread out from there. That's what they say. That's their narrative. But when we have El Perazo, and Chavan de Huentar down here in the south that are actually older. And that's and that's not even considering this Carol culture that I found. Um, they're 180 miles um, from the archaeological sites of Ch Chavan de Huentar. And they're estimated to start their society about 3000 BC. And I wanted to put Machu Picchu in there so you can kind of get an idea where that's at. And we're going to talk about Puma Punko later. Now on the left over here, um, many people have heard me claim in prior videos, prior live streams, that <clears throat> there's a southern site that actually predates all northern sites. Now, there is Chan Chan in Peru, but they are Peruvian Chan Chan. These are the Chile Chan Chan. And this is, this is what they say, but <clears throat> the Chan Chan actually date to 6400 BC, almost three and a half thousand years before um, before the Andean civilizations, which is the Moche, the Inca, and stuff like that. 3,000 years. Now, I want you to kind of look at something. Look at North America and look at South America. A lot of people think that North America and South America are like right on top of each other or in line with each other. They're really not. So they have a huge issue. If you ever get on Google Maps, just look at it. You know, go from Peru and slowly turn the world, and you'll see there's a massive amount of water. Well, they can't figure out how did they do this? They couldn't have used the land bridge to come down because the North American societies are definitely, we can link them to the land bridge, but these South American societies, they have no idea. And so what they'll do is they'll actually invoke continental shifting, which that's ridiculous. It would have killed everybody because they couldn't have had that kind of technology to come over. But we are clearly seeing that that technology is in, is in question big time. All right. So this might be, it's a little confusing, um, but I'll go, <clears throat> sorry guys, I'll go over it just a little bit. So, uh, well, actually I'll just name everything with their date. So Monte de Acati is the one on, um, Sardinia, which is just to the West of Italy, it's 3,500 BC, Hellenicon Mycenaean. And like I said before, Minoan is before Mycenaean. This one's dated to 2000 to, uh, 200 BC. Lerna, which is also known as the house of tiles is dated between 3000 to 2300 BC. Now, Egypt, Egypt is a mess. The Pyramid of Dozier, Dozier is dated to 4700 BC, but they don't have a complex society, and it's not a very big site. Uh, Hieronacopolis, or however it's pronounced on one of my previous slides, um, dates to 3500 BC. And yet they have this complex pyramid before that. It's kind of, it's really messed up. Uh, lower and upper in Egypt don't get combined until uh, 2800 BC. Now remember, these are all secular timelines. <clears throat> and then about 25, 26 to 2500 BC is like the pyramids of Giza and stuff like that. And then you've got ancient uh, Nubia, which is the Kushite empire. 
they have almost 250 pyramids spread from just south of where I have that pyramid to a little bit north, uh, covering and spanning the entire Kushite uh, Empire, 2500 BC to 1500 BC. Now they'll try to say, well, the Egyptians influenced the uh, the Nubians. Okay, but if they actually came out of Africa, why would they pass by Sudan, pass by Egypt? Because you're going to see how these dates are all messed up. Go and create these places, and then come and then go back into Sudan. It doesn't really make any sense. All right, Gobek Gobekli Tepe is given an extreme date of 12,000 BC. And then we're going to go over here to Mesopotamia. Some of the Mesopotamian dates can date up to about 4,000. BC, I think even 4,500 BC. Um, my ancient civilizations class said that they became sedentary, means they stopped moving about 5,500 BC. And I noticed something very interesting about uh, about Upper and Lower Mesopotamia. It's not the same thing as Lower and Upper Egypt, like Lower Egypt is actually North and Upper Egypt is South, kind of backwards. Mesopotamia is not that way. If I say Upper, I'm actually talking about the Northern region and uh, Lower is actually the Southern where Yur is the city of Ur. And what they do, what I've noticed that they will date upper Mesopotamia older than Southern or than lower Mesopotamia, which is where Ur is. I found that kind of interesting. You can go check me on that. Just go and look at the dates. They will actually get them older. Um, and then let's see. Uh, okay. So like Chagra Zam Zambil is actually quite new. It's like 1200 BC or something like that. But the ancient Susan empire, uh, predates uh, the Persian Empire. And before before a lot of evolutionary stuff, you know, has really come into history and anthropology, not so much anthropology, um, this orange circle that I have in the middle, that is the cradle of civilization. If you want to know where the Tower of Babel is, it's disputed, not like highly disputed or anything like that. They're really unsure whether it was in upper or lower Mesopotamia. But if you're looking for, you know, where the Tower of Babel was, and then where Abraham comes out um, a little bit later, it's right there. This is the cradle of civilization. All right, now let's jump over to the Indus Valley, um, where you see ancient Harappa, Megar, and Mohenjo-Daro. Mohenjo All right, this is even more confusing. Ancient Harappa uh, gave the Indus Valley the name of the, Har the Harappan culture, and it's because they have this very complex site but they have no tools no pots they have nothing all they know is that they have this uh it's it's a temple they've got a public bath they've got some other they think are common areas they have no idea but because there's no writings nothing is left maybe because it was looted who knows they really have no idea they don't even really have pot shards they date it to about 8000 bc to almost 10000 bc and they have no idea why but they stopped Stopping a civilization, either they were uh, attacked and killed or uh, newer groups of people that moved into the Indus Valley. This is their narrative, by the way. Um, they just like meshed with them and then just disappeared as a people. Now, Megar is dated to 3000 BC and Mohenjo-Daro is dated to 2500 BC. And then, like I said, you know, previously, Ur Urlatau and the Zaya dynasty are, we'll just put them about 2000 BC. So let's, let's, let's play out this narrative, right? So they come out of Africa and they go to Gobekli Tepe and they go and build this megalithic structure that they're still, they've only uncovered like 10% of it or something like that. And then they're going to go to Harappa and then they're going to go to Italy and then they're going to somehow spread out and go to these other places. And then they're going to go back down into Africa. It honestly makes no sense. But from a biblical narrative, if we came from where the Tower of Babel is in the cradle of civilization of Mesopotamia, it actually makes more sense. Because um, as you see these dates, I mean, besides ancient Harappa and the Gobekli, Gobekli Tepe <clears throat> and a uh, possible, you know, bad date for the, for the pyramid in Italy or on Sardinia. Most of these actually line up with Mesopotamia. Even in their secular timelines, they actually kind of line up, meaning they got dispersed from the Tower of Babel, and there they go, out. They go to the Indus Valley, they go up into Turkey, they go to Egypt, and then slowly move down into Sudan, and then they slowly move into Greece, uh, Crete, and then um, Sardinia. And then took maybe, I don't know, five centuries or something like that, and they make it out to East China. 
So it's really interesting how their storytelling works. But this is something else that I really wanted to talk about as well, because there are a lot of um, sites out there that they can't explain. And more than likely, a lot of these dates are probably wrong for them. I didn't do a, um, a ton of like background research on that to give you any kind of um, uh, like resources or anything. But let's just look at them and let's just talk about them. So Stonehenge, for centuries, they have no idea why they built it, how they could have done that, because these stones are pretty heavy. And they date it to about 3000 BC. They call it, they called it at one point, the oldest Neolithic structure. So these hunter and gatherers that were barely learning how to eat meat and use fire and stuff like that made a temple, a, you know, an open air temple that actually reflected the heavens with huge, heavy rocks. It doesn't actually make any sense. This is another one that I always find kind of interesting because the Sphinx, some people think the Sphinx is actually older than the pyramids of Giza. Now, regardless of how you believe that's totally, you know, it's totally fine if you believe they're older or younger, but it's just that just the constructions of them are so massive. I think people forget how big they are. And the Sphinx is dated to about 2600 to 2500 BC, about the same times, uh, time as the pyramid of Giza. The Nazca lines. So the Nazca people lived in um, mid Peru. They're considered underneath the Andean civilizations. These are so complex that they have to use aircrafts just to even see them because we can't see the whole thing because of how big they are. And I felt really bad for this one historian. He actually suggested that the Nazca people had hot air balloons. He was laughed at because no, they couldn't have had that kind of technology. Why not? Why is technology being thrown out? Oh, because they have a narrative like the three age system that I talked about. It has to go from simple to complex. So they, so they invoke aliens. They have no idea how these were done and they reflect the heavens with preciseness that they couldn't have had back then. That's what historians will say. Okay. Next is a place I can't pronounce. <laughs> it's in the Cusco Valley um, in Peru. This is actually near Machu Picchu. Um, but if you just Google some closer images of these, of these walls, um, that they made, they are cut very precisely. You can't stick a piece of paper in between them. Uh, now they date these, mm, I think it's like 800 to 1100 AD, but you can actually see newer and older constructions when you look at these. So there's a lot of conflicting, um, well, a lot of people don't agree. A lot of historians and archeologists will disagree because they can clearly see different constructions. And looking at this top left picture over here, this is actually a fortress um, that's lower than Machu Picchu, but it's near Machu Picchu. That does not look like they were just stumbling around, you know, putting rocks together like Legos. They knew exactly what they were doing. It was geometrically circular. The squares, the layout, it took a lot of thought and it took people that know what they were doing with using, you know, construction, engineering, all that kind of stuff. Now here's Machu Picchu. And I don't know about you, but when I look at that, I think, wow, they built into the side of cliffs. And if we go by the evolutionary narrative, how many of them died falling off the side of the cliffs trying to <laughs> construct all of this? There wouldn't be anybody left. And knowing how they portray ancient man as superstitious and all that kind of stuff, they would have left that place if that many people died. There are just so many things that we have to look at. And if you ever uh, Google it and get some closer up pictures, you will see that it looks like there's some older constructions and some newer constructions because they're not quite the same. There's rocks that fit together, just like those previous walls I showed you. And then you can see where there are others where rocks are stacked with mortar in between them. You can clearly see two different times. And the Inca will actually, in their legend, say that they inherited these sites. They were there prior, basically. It's actually pretty neat. I love this one. This one's great. Okay, so Tiwanaku is a town in Bolivia. <clears throat> Pumapuku is this particular site. Tiwanaku also has another site, and I'll explain why there's, basically there's kind of three sites, because there's one at Lake Titicaca too. So if you look where Peru and Bolivia are, um, Tiwanaku, the town of Tiwanaku is, I think, 20 miles from the lake. And also, just as another note, this is very high up. I think the elevation here is like nine or 10,000 feet. It's very high up. Um, and Lake Titicaca actually goes a little bit into Bolivia, but it's mostly in Peru. So it's like right there on that border. Um, these stones that you see stacked on this right, this archaeologists have been stacked, moving these stones or, 
you know, shifting them around so they can display them, study them, measure them or whatever. But these stones were actually shoved and pushed by something massive because you can see how big they are a long time ago. But it would be very hard to have a flood at 10,000 feet, and especially when Lake Titicaca is actually lower um, than this site here at Pumapunku, which is not far from the town of uh, Tiwanaku. Now, I want you to take a look at this huge uh, column on the, on the left. It is broken in half. You can see that something massive broke it in half. I personally do not believe the timelines that they give for it. They give the timeline of 300 to 600 AD. I think it's more than likely a lot older because this stone on the left is one solid carving. If they mess up just once, they'd have to get a new one. The stone probably weighed a thousand tons, even up to some of them up to 2000 tons. That's huge. And for something like that, just to break it in half, it would be hard for us to do that today. And if you Google some of these pictures, you know, you can see where there's literally precise carvings, holes drilled, lines, and they are all at perfect 90 degree angles. Now, this is pretty neat, too, because uh, this is the gateway of the sun, I think. Um, but there's something really interesting that that little guy that's drawn up at the top is actually called the staff god. And they found a gourd, which is basically just kind of like a big kind of like fat bottle, like an old one. With a, with a depiction of the staff god on there. And they dated it to 2300 BC. And this is down in South America. This is way prior than the Olmec, the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Zapotecs, and even North America. And I actually forgot to get into that earlier. And then they found another gourd, um, a newerly made gourd, obviously, dated to 600 AD. And I have the picture side by side. They look just like this. And they look just like the old gourd from 2300 BC to the one in 600 BC. Now, um, Pumapunku and Tiwanaku sites, they actually had to dig a lot of this out of mud. Like there was like 10, 15 feet of mud on a lot of this, these structures. So it is possible that this could be an antediluvian structure. We don't know for sure, but it's really not a bad possibility. And especially with how precise their constructions are, it's pretty amazing. So Lake Titicaca, the reason why it's kind of important is because there's a sunken temple in there. And the Incans uh, thought that their original ancestor came out of the lake. And so they would give sacrifices, uh, drop herbs and all that kind of stuff into the lake. I really couldn't find any good pictures for um, underneath the lake. I kept coming up with like Pinterest and stuff like that. And those did not look legitimate. So I just didn't show any of those. Um, but it's another interesting one to look into. And they have Lake Titicaca dated to 500 to 1000 AD which is really interesting. So Pumapunku is dated to 300 to 600 AD. The Tiwanaku site is dated 200 BC to 200 AD, um, which is the gate of the sun. Actually, I'll just go back to that previous one. This one's 200 BC to 200 AD. And then Lake Titicaca, which is only 20 miles away, then underwater temples 500 to 1000 AD. Their dates are all messed up. Now I wanted to show... Um, the temple or the uh, pyramids of the moon and sun, Te Teotihuacan again, because if you look really closely on that top left picture, you can see a bunch of like little mini ziggurats reflecting a much larger one. And it actually looks very much like uh, the ziggurat at Ur and uh, Chang, Chang Zanbil or whatever in Iran. <clears throat> and they have no idea who constructed these. So first I'll make a, a little comment. I meant to make a connection to this, um, but as we can see the design in history just through the just through the pyramids, um, the Tower of Babel was not circular. Uh, there has a lot been a lot of commentary done on it, um, and especially by Josephus and some other very old historians that are just maybe a century or two after um, the death and resurrection of Christ. They talk about that that the Tower of Babel was a ziggurat, meaning it was square; it was not circular. So get like the bathtub arc out of your head, you know, that cute little circular bathtub with animals hanging off of it. All right. Well, the, the Tower of Babel was not circular because if we go to Meso Mesopotamia, we look at their temples and pyramids and ziggurats, which are all the same thing. Basically, they're all square. So the Tower of Babel is actually square. So when we look around the world, a place like Teotihuacan, um, <clears throat> Pumapunku, all these places, they all have square temple ziggurats, stepped pyramids. All right, so historical markers. I cannot give you arbitrary dates. All I can all I can do is give you um, 
what other apologists have said when the worldwide flood was, <clears throat> which is about 2400 to 2300 BC. You can add in 50 years here. You can add in 50 years there. Um, I would say you could even potentially even push it 150 years. I wouldn't go any further because then we'll start having gaps with genealogies. So from the Tower of Babel, you have three generations. And that is, um, I forgot his name, but Peleg was the first post generation after Babel. And then Abraham was born in the city of Ur and he's six to seven generations. And the reason why they say six to seven generations is because Terah, his father, was 70 before he was born. How do you calculate a generation? Typically, it's about half the age when you have children, about 20 to I think it's like 30 or maybe 40 years. Well, he was 70. So this is the reason why I added in the 50 years of 100 to 150 and then 250 to 300 years. Now, where should we start? You start from the city of Ur because the Bible says that that was the first city after the Tower of Babel. So we start from there. And we can say circa, generally speaking, the city of Ur probably started being constructed about 2050 BC. And if you look up the times for Abraham's birth, um, you'll see 2000 BC, you'll see 1995 BC, 1990 BC. So we're really not that far off. Cities don't actually take that long to make. 20 years, you could push it to 50 years if you really want to. But <clears throat> those who have lived in cities over the past, you know, 20 years have seen a massive change in cities, their size, people, all that kind of stuff. So it's not hard to believe that a city, you know, a thriving port city could be built in actually probably much less time than 50 years. After that, this is my personal opinion. Go two through five. Because Mesopotamia is where they all got spread out from the Tower of Babel. All right. So they went into Egypt. They went into Indus Valley. They went into Turkey. And then from there, you can take Egypt to um, Sudan. And then you can take uh, Turkey, that they went to Greece, Crete, and Italy. And then from the Indus Valley to ancient China and any other sites that are to the east. Now, the New World Civilizations draw a line right there, all right? Because the New World Civilizations are completely different because there are two different ways that people got to the New World. The land bridge in the north and then down south. Now, how do we answer for that? Because they'll say, well, that doesn't answer in your model either. Well, actually, yes, it does. Because if Noah knew how to build a gigantic ark that withstood tsunamis and massive waves and horrible weather and basically the world being torn apart by water, they can build boats and go from Egypt over into uh, you know, Mesoamerica. It's absolutely possible. And they could have gone the other direction too. too. Um, and then they also came over the land bridge. It's both. And I actually, and I actually forgot to say that about North America, but the oldest structure that we have in North America, that's a, a, a structure, not some campfire that they say they found is poverty point. And it's in uh, Northern Louisiana. And they say it's 1600 to 1300 BC, but then nothing else occurs for at least another thousand years for anything big is constructed. And that would be, let's see, like as another example, the Taos Pueblos um, in New Mexico, they say they first inhabited there 3000 BC, but there's no prehistoric ruins till 900 AD. It's a gigantic time period. And so the narrative of, of North American Indians coming over the land bridge, absolutely, but does not account for the Andean civilizations, the Chile civilizations, and the Middle America civilizations. So these are for you guys just to research, you know, ha have fun with them, look at them. I, I can't tell you that these are actually pre-flood. Um, I don't think that they really could be because it'd be hard for them to stay intact, especially with that much continental shifting and everything. But it's, it, it's possible. Um, the Yo Yo Yonaguni Pyramid in Japan is really neat. Very, very, very neat. Go and check it out. Most of these, they date uh, between five to 25,000 years ago. Like Gobekli Tepe is dated 12,000 years. I put Puma Puku on here because I do not believe that they actually uh, uh, dated it correctly because it's actually covered in mega sequences. And if you've seen some of our other models on Sandy for Truth's channel, um, you'll see that the, the different sequences of mud and sediment that was laid down by the flood. And uh, Puma Punku was actually covered in that. And it actually shifted some of those, you know, several hundred ton to like 800 ton rocks miles away from the original place that it was at. And you can see that if you look up more. The 
Trilithon at Baalbek. This is a gigantic rectangular square. It's not like a pillar. It doesn't have roundness or anything like that. But it is 1,200 tons. And it's half in the ground. I absolutely believe that one's more than likely pre-flood. Um, Lake Titicaca, that's another one. It, that's potential. But like I said, I couldn't find any pictures of the temple. Dwarka City, this is an interesting one. It was actually a myth for centuries that there was a city that sunk into the water because the gods got mad. And it was a, it was actually the golden city of Krishna, their god Krishna. And so somebody in the mid-1900s was like, oh, I'm going to go see if there's actually anything down there. They found an underwater city. thought that was kind of interesting. I forget what they dated on it. Um, the pyramids of the Azores Islands. They say there's one underwater. I couldn't actually find that one. But there are pyramids on the Azores Islands. If you want to know where that's at, just look at Portugal and just go west a little bit and start to zoom in on your Google map and you'll start to see these islands popping up. Um, I didn't look up much about uh, Pavlo Petri, Greece, but it's another underwater city. This one's kind of interesting. This is um, off the coast of Israel or near Israel. And they say that there's a Stonehenge down there and that they have evidence that it was Neolithic villages that are buried in water, which I don't personally believe. Um, that could have just like, I, you know, I'm not really sure about those. I didn't actually like look up like really detailed stuff, but I just thought it was kind of interesting. These are a potential. I'm not saying that they are, but you know, that's one of the best things about history is that you can have your own theories based in history because these are there. They're not, I'm not making these up. You can go and look them up. They're, they're really amazing to look at. And yeah, I hope I covered everything and now we're ready for questions and I'll stop sharing.